Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining the December meeting for Governor Cooper's Advisory Council on Film, Television, and Digital Streaming. Um, I'm Secretary Susie Hamilton. I'm chair of this committee, and I will take a moment to welcome all of you and to remind you that this is a public meeting again, and it will be live streamed as well as published in, on YouTube after the meeting so that people can see it after, uh, after we finish as well. Um, if you will, uh, Catherine is going to go through the list for a, a roll call. If you could um, uh, just identify yourselves when she calls your name and Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, if you'll just, uh, members of the council, please identify yourselves when I call your name. Uh, Amy Tiemann. Present. Beth Petty. Bill Vassar. I'm here. Thank you. Bill Sappho. Chris Cooney. Present. Dale Williams. Darla McGlamory. David Burris. Chip Heckler. Here. Eric Johnson. Here. Herman Stone. John Bankson. Here. Johnny Griffin. Here. Judy Gerard. Here. Lana Garland. Lauren Vilchik. Here. Michael McGaha, sorry. Rebecca Clark. I'm here. Robert Newton. Here. Tim Bourne. Here. Todd Thorne. Hunter Widener. Here. Jonas Pate. Lindsey Bierman. Here. Trey Rabin. Present. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Secretary, back to you. We lose the secretary. Yeah, she's on mute. She's on mute. So sorry. Um, so we've got everybody that's joined us today and we thank you for it. Um, first, I want to officially wish everybody happy holidays and um, give you a few updates from the governor's office. And we'll start with um, the COVID numbers. As uh, many of you have seen and heard, um, our COVID numbers are uh, on the rise and we had um, two record setting days uh, over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Um, the record setting was not just uh, meeting a new milestone by one or two or three cases. Uh, unfortunately, that the new, the new highs beat the old high uh, by several thousand cases. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's a grim uh, prospect right now. Uh, the other bad news is that we do not and we do not count uh, the more recent the, the cases that we saw over the weekend um, as part of the um, the Thanksgiving spike. Uh, we anticipate that the Thanksgiving spike will actually uh, come later this week and early into next. So we believe that uh, this information is critical. We need to continue to remind everyone to follow the three W's, wear your mask, wash your hands and wait six feet apart. Um, the governor will have a press conference at three o'clock this afternoon uh, where he'll be announcing another executive order that I believe will uh, go into effect on Friday when his, his current executive order is set to expire. Um, so that is where we are on COVID. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm happy to, to answer. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and also, I want to thank you all for the, your time and your service this year. Um, it has been an unprecedented year, obviously, 
And we've um, really appreciated the opportunity to work with each and every one of you over this year. And even though it became virtual uh, and it's, it's apparently gonna stay that way for a few more months, uh, we are looking forward to uh, producing this final report and to continuing our work into 2021 and beyond. Uh, so at the end of the meeting, I think we'll be setting our, our 2021 dates for our meetings and hopefully um, getting more into some subcommittee work um, during 2021. And um, I think with that said, um, I'll turn it back over to Catherine and Guy Gaster um, for any updates they have. So thank you. Um, but before I do that, does anyone else have updates they'd like to share? Okay, if something comes up, uh, please feel free to, to jump in and let us know. But other than that, Catherine? Okay, thank you, Secretary. Um, I actually was gonna give Guy an opportunity to give us an update from the film, uh, film office. Uh, and Guy, if you wanna share your screen, I think he has a, a brief presentation as well. Thank you, Catherine. Apologies, here we go. All right. <laughs> So uh, just to, to kind of continue the update that uh, was shared uh, with you last time we were together, um, we're still combining or gathering the final information with regards to 2020, but all things considered, uh, it has been a successful year uh, despite a complete shutdown uh, of the industry for four plus months. Uh, we've had 66 projects uh, that have filed intent to film forms with the state. 11 of those projects um, qualified and were approved for the state's grant uh, rebate program. Uh, again, you can see the numbers, but 100 or 1,500 uh, plus crew hires. And again, those uh, employment numbers do not include uh, the drop-in type projects uh, that we've also seen. Uh, all told, uh, this is a new number uh, for you, and it is a little bit less than the number I'd reported before, uh, but that is a reflection of some of the spending uh, shifting. Uh, we're looking at uh, $106.7 million being spent directly in the state by the productions. Uh, and again, we have had filming take place across the state. Um, and I do want to say these are preliminary numbers once again. These are not final numbers for 2020. Uh, we will have those at the first of the year. Uh, so just looking at how that compares, once again, uh, 107 uh, with the roundup. So a uh, pretty good year. Um, all, again, all things considered uh, with it. In terms of the job opportunities, uh, again, it's pretty much in line with the spending um, there. So looking ahead, uh, this is uh, very exciting and, and a, a new place uh, for the state. We already have eight projects, uh, major projects that have committed to North Carolina. Um, those eight projects uh, are estimated to have a $114 million plus million dollar uh, impact uh, to the state. Uh, so this is a position, again, that we've not been in uh, previously, where we are starting off the year uh, with the, those kinds of figures. Um, of those eight projects, uh, filming will take place in the, uh, looking at the prosperity zones, the southeast, the southwest, and western prosperity zone. Uh, we certainly expect there to be filming in other areas uh, as well. Um, there are a number of reality and lifestyle TV shows that are awaiting official approval for another season uh, that take place in other parts of the state. Uh, if those are picked up, that will certainly help us out. And of those eight projects, uh, three are continuations of uh, TV and or streaming series that are filming right now. And then we'll have the start of principal photography for five feature length films. Uh, these numbers also continue to change on a daily basis, uh, and we continue to see high interest uh, from the industry as, as we move forward. Uh, so just for comparison's sake, 
once again, bringing up that direct spending uh, number chart, you can see the 114 uh, already surpasses what our total for 2020 would be. So uh, the future is shaping up to be uh, quite positive here in the state in terms of projects. Uh, that does lead me to one of the, as we look at what we can do moving forward as well with the projects, uh, there's certainly going to be an emphasis on some uh, workforce development. Uh, and I think that, that uh, we're, we're seeing the need for that even more so with the, we've already identified it as being an area that we're probably behind in. I think with this uptick in interest uh, from productions, it's showing uh, there is a demand there and hopefully that can be a catalyst for getting um, a, a new program going. Uh, we're also working on updating some of our locations libraries from across the state uh, as two of the two of the really big initiatives from my office, aside from just the recruitment of productions. Uh, as always, you have my contact information, but if you need uh, have any questions or would like more information, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, I've also provided this report. Uh, to Catherine, and I believe it will be made available in the shared folder uh, after the meeting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Judy, is that a better background? Oh, much better. <laughs> much better. <laughs> yes. It, it, made, it made me find a picture from my roll call so that much I Much better. Yeah, yes. much better. Gives me hope even. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much, Guy, and um, thank you for sharing, um, you know, what turned out to be a, a pretty good year overall, but uh, our hope for the new year abounds, and uh, we believe that uh, we've, we're positioned very well, and, and everyone on this call has, has uh, had a big, uh, big part to play in that. Um, since our last meeting, we've compiled everyone's feedback and notes. Uh, our recommendations document. We condensed the text and added an executive summary section to capture the priority recommendations um, from this council. So Catherine um, has uh, pulled uh, all this information together uh, with the help of her staff and others, including Guy. And uh, I'm going to, if you'll pull it up, Catherine, Yes. Uh, and go ahead and share the screen. And Catherine is going to go through the changes uh, that uh, you all have, have made. Uh, the governor's office has weighed in as well. And so I will let her uh, go through those for us. Okay. <clears throat> Matt, could you allow me to share my screen, please? Thank you. Thank you. A moment here. Okay. Can you all see this? No, not yet. One moment. Is that pulling up? Nope. Hmm. One moment here. So sorry. Guy, I have a naive question while she's doing that. Are only films um, eligible for grants? No, um, feature link films are uh, with feature link that could include documentaries. Um, I realize that our budget numbers are high for documentaries. Obviously, television and streaming uh, series are eligible. 
Um, technically, commercials are eligible. Um, and we've also got that uh, subcategory within the feature link films of made for TV movies. Thank you. Okay, I hope everyone can see the screen now. It says it's working. Okay, thank you. So, um, as Secretary mentioned, uh, we condensed it quite a bit. Uh, frankly, a lot has changed since when our first draft of this in September. So um, we tried to um, condense it to the most important points. I truly appreciate everyone's detailed feedback and comments. Um, and I hope to send this around again, since as Secretary mentioned, we have a little more time. Um, I, I really would like everybody to kind of weigh in on this new version. Um, and my thinking is, we'll send it around um, with Guy's presentation after this. And then in our January meeting, we will go ahead and set a time for that. And then we can do a final review at that time. So we added, I, I would say the biggest significant addition is this kind of executive summary kind of section that we added that really highlights and tries to prioritize some of the bullets. Um, of our top line recommendations. Um, in the overview, we condensed it. And um, Eric, thank you. We talked about the opportunity for post-production since so much of that is going on. And I heard Tim say pre-production, you know, all of those opportunities continue to grow um, as people are learning how to work more effectively virtually. Uh, then we added in, um, the addition of the Andrea Harris Social Economic Environmental and Health Equity Task Force, which will likely influence some of policy recommendations that will be helpful to film. And um, the industry has also released kind of more health and safety guidelines. And I know Guy's office has been sharing those. So in the summary of recommendations, and I, I think you know, we can kind of walk through this today and then I'll send it around. Um, but essentially, you know, they, we talked about uh, funding on a recurring basis, appropriate checks and balances, um, training um, and mentorship opportunities for underrepresented communities using incentives as a catalyst. And then we agreed that, you know, upon review and feedback, uh, we would want to message out and maybe um, do some targeted communications to okay. industry and, and others. So I would say that one of the biggest pieces of feedback received uh, is about restoring the refundable tax credit that expired in 2014. Um, rewriting legislation to be more holistic and aligned with the current needs and that we have supporting data to show perhaps some benefits of that. Uh, we talked a lot about eliminating per project caps and diversifying some of the funding sources uh, based on the varying needs of the industry. Uh, articulate and maybe re-message or uh, push harder on some messaging about uh, HB2 rescinded and some of the cultural context messaging about North Carolina. We talked about a current rebate pool to be more competitive with other states and establish separate funds to align with priorities around economic development and job creation. Timeframes that don't require annual review, uh, just being more nimble across the board and process. And then, you know, again, we've got new legislatures in place and it is an opportunity perhaps to rearticulate um, what support of this industry means and how it impacts um, a wide range of factors in the state. Um, some of this is repetitive and uh, since Guy's presentation today, I need to update this, but I will do that before we send it around. But I would love some, feedback um, and maybe a little discussion on, 
you know, kind of these top lines and if we've missed any kind of major priorities that we want to include in those recommendations. What happened with um, getting rid of the, what was it called, the harm to teens or something, the content review by the legislature? What happened to that? Harmful to minors. That's also in here, Judy. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's a big one, of course. Because that's a big one, right? Yes. Uh, that one will, um, that one will take uh, legislative action, just to remind everybody. Yeah. Um, as will most of uh, these, you know, a good portion of these recommendations will 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 require legislative approval. So, um, I, you know, I don't know if anyone wants uh, to delve into that. Um, uh, where what we think is uh, are some of the the, the most um, plausible uh, changes that we think the legislature would work with us on. So um, you may want to be giving that some thought. I think a key piece, and I don't know if it's it's articulated in the document, but being sure to illustrate how um, you know there may be extra incentives to encourage production in other regions of the state. This has to be a win-win for the whole state um, to get the kind of buy-in and the ongoing support. So making sure that there are incentives to shoot in other parts of the state, additional incentives to use uh, crew based in the state. And just really, the more this works for North Carolina and North Carolinians, the more this becomes a no-brainer. So just making sure that language is clear and articulated kind of okay. out. I agree. I, I, I think that's a really, really valid point. And if we've not said that enough in the document, I think that we need to, we need to add, we need to state it very strongly that, you know, uh, we'll, we may put that in the executive summary. Let us think about that. And, and we'll, we'll uh, make that um, addition or strengthen what we've got. I have one comment and one question. Um, in the point about restore the refundable tax credit that expired, um, I think it's really great that the data is pretty, you know, the graphs are on like the next page that show that. I might, I just might write this a little more strongly, that last point about you know, now we've seen that this, the benefit to the state was greater under that old program. Um, I just think that that is the key point. Um, so I would just really think about even strengthening that. Um, and my cr question is re restoring the refundable tax credit versus the point about increasing the rebate pool. Those would be like an either or, is that correct? Guy, I'm gonna let you tackle that, if you would, please. I'm happy to attempt to, although I, I would have to send it back to you guys in that, yes, I would think, Amy, to answer your question directly, it would be an either or. If you're going to uh, go to the previous program in its iteration, there was no annual cap. So uh, the current rebate pool uh, of funds available, therefore there would not be an, an annual pool. Um, so I think that yes, that your, your point is probably made that that bullet should indicate if we're increasing the pool that's in lieu of the other program or if the other program were to return but there was a cap that it, it be more than what is currently available. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Amy, we we took um, we were somewhat cautious in uh, uh, the uh, you know the returning to um, the program and, and and so let us think about that. We 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 want to make sure that we're um, working in 
in lockstep with what we think the legislators are um, going to be willing to discuss with us and um, and with the governor and um, let us let's let us think about how we might state that a little more strongly. Again, we might put something mention the difference in the numbers and the and possibly in the executive summary, but let us take a look at it. It's a valid point. Thank you. Catherine, can you um, also further explain the, the timetable uh, point or the time frames that don't require annual review? What is meant uh, by that? This was feedback um, from on the Google Doc and um, I believe the point is obviously, you know, stabilizing kind of um, production review processes and so that, you know, there, there's limited or lower uncertainty around when things can begin and end. And honestly, I'm not sure, I'm not clear if that also pertains to like uh, local permitting processes as well. Um, again, this is a, a collective of feedback. So I'll send it around and let everyone kind of extrapolate some of the points that perhaps they meant by their comments. Yeah, I think that did come out of that section of working with local governments to streamline you know, permitting processes. And my guess is that there's some local governments out there that don't even, even have, I don't know, maybe not Johnny and others, Rebecca might know better than me, but um, that was definitely in the local government piece, I'm pretty sure. And I'm not sure how much of a barrier that is now. I mean, um, there, uh, it seems like filming occurs in places where that seems pretty, um, you know, systematic and efficient. But if we're looking at filming opportunities across the state, there may be some support to help some of those kind of local groups understand how to make that more friendly and expedite. Anyone want to kind of comment on that from their experience? I can comment that um, filming North Carolina and dealing with permitting has been a very uh, easy, efficient process, regardless of where I've shot. I've had no problems. And comparative to at Los Angeles, it's a dream. That's good, yes. Okay. Guys, is there any um, feedback from kind of your discussions um, about anything that might be kind of a new barrier or uh, perhaps something to highlight that's working well in North Carolina versus some of other competing states? Well, I guess on the same um, bullet, and that, that was why I raised that this question is that I think the current legislature has done a very good job of making the current program uh, stable and reliable um, to the industry because of it being labeled recurring funds, they're not being a sunset date. So I, I just would, maybe it's just my, my own lens, but as I see that bullet, if it is talking about more local processes, uh, I think that needs to be clearer um, because as we go out and, and promote right now, there is that uh, same sort of not being at the legislative whelm, if you will, like there is in Georgia. Don't get me wrong, there, I realize that Georgia has definitely um, other differences with their incentive, but in terms of, you know, is the money there, um, we've done what we can to ensure that it's there and, and not have to wait to see if a budget passes or, or where that, that lies uh, there. Um, so that that's definitely something that the industry has um, had interest in, and, and I feel that the legislature has helped firm up um, as we continue to move forward uh, with it. 
Yeah, I've heard similar feedback. Thank you. That's true. I think the the uh, the other challenge is um, two part with it. Uh, you know, the ease of the program, the straight 25% is one that I know is looked at favorably. Um, of course, there's always, a production's always looking for upticks, if you will, like shooting in um, not as frequently used areas, uh, but certainly the 25% and it being straightforward has been favorably received. Uh, the other part that we're starting to see, uh, which, you know, we've addressed somewhat or, or looking to address with workforce development has been uh, the, the diversity of crew and, and support services. Um, and I think as we continue to work with studios, there's being a, a top down um, issue to these productions to look at uh, diversifying their uh, their crews that they hire um, and also diversifying with the businesses that they interact with when they're on the ground uh, as well. Thank you, Guy. Are there any workforce development programs that you think are good models for the state as that become, has become more of a priority? I know a lot of people refer to the Georgia Film Academy. Um, it, it certainly had uh, um, its pluses and minuses and, and Tim might be able to talk more, not to put Tim on the spot, uh, but having done more in Georgia, you know, with the graduates that are coming uh, out of that. Uh, but I, I do think that there are some programs that we currently have within our own community college system that may be able to expand a little more and uh, we get some additional uh, professionals in working with some of the community college staff uh, that, that can get us pointed in the right direction with that. Uh, I just saw that uh, Lana, sorry, Lana, I uh, put in uh, New Orleans, you're right, definitely also has a, a, a good program um, that they've been using, and I've reached out to that to that group uh, to see about their interests and being able to help uh, here in North Carolina um, as well. And and that Novak is the the group has um, expressed interest, and we actually had them lined up if a um, one of the TV series we had had gone multiple seasons, they were ready to come in with a season two. Uh, internship and training program and unfortunately that series didn't move forward so we were back to square one if you will. Tim did you want to add something? Um, just practically speaking the Georgia Academy really hasn't made an impact on you know the films I've been on. I can't speak for others but we do get people um, in a lot at entry levels from Georgia State University there in Atlanta, but not necessarily specifically from, you know, the academy. Okay. There is no mandate to, you know, to, to even take meetings uh, with people or, you know, it, it's mentioned um, and then sort of as, as an afterthought. Okay, that's good to know. <clears throat> okay, so what I'd like to do, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And what I'd like to do is send this around. I'll also put it in the uh, Google Doc, Google folder with Guy's presentation. Um, and I think the secretary wanted us to look at some dates for January for a subsequent meeting. Also in that meeting in January, what we'd like to do is go ahead and set the quarterly meeting for the council for the new year. Um, and I think, you know, it may be prudent in the January meeting, once we finalize the recommendations is to establish um, some subcommittees and groups to do some work that we've kind of talked about. Um, 
So let me um, look at throw out some dates for okay, so one possibility would be Tuesday, January twelfth. How does that date look for everyone? Um, I think we would want to keep the 10 to 12 time frame. Um, I think in January it, it will still be virtual. So Tuesday, 10, uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday, January 12th from 10 to 12. Does that work? Works for me. Okay, great. Um, then I will send this around with a report, post on the Google share, and uh, then we will send up the follow-up meeting for the January meeting to finalize the recommendations. Obviously, if anyone has questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you, Secretary. I'm going to hand it back over to you. Okay. I'm trying to make sure I've got it set properly. Um, well, again, um, thank you, everyone. I, I, um, we would love to entertain some questions, some feedback, some thoughts for a few minutes. If, if we have plenty of time, um, we don't have to do that, but we certainly um, would be willing to entertain questions or comments or updates from anything from anyone else. We'd love to have some good news. Are you raising your hand? <laughs> All right, Mr. Bourne, go for it. Just, um, I don't know if this is good news, but it's informative uh, and it, it, it strengthens what our goal is here is um, I'm, one of the movies that I'm prepping right now is for um, Paramount's new revived arm, Paramount, uh, is it Partners? I can't, for whatever reason. <laughs> Anyway, it's it's sort of like the Fox 2000. It's the Paramount version of Fox 2000. But anyway, uh, there was a movie that was being kicked around for a while called The In-Between. And it was definitely squared to shoot here in Wilmington area because they needed beach locations. Um, and they had prepped it. They had scouted it. They had budgeted it. And now they cast a young lady who is going to make upwards of $4 million. So that movie um, immediately was taken away from North Carolina and put into Georgia. So whatever, whoever needs to hear that kind of story, that, that, that is something that I have, you know, even went back to and ran some numbers to see if, um, you know, doing a comparison about moving from an Atlanta location to a Savannah or Tybee Island or, St. Catharines, you know, what those additional costs would be and weigh that against the loss of revenue from the above the line salary. And it still wasn't close. So um, it just fortifies that, that point in our argument that this cap on above the line um, uh, salaries is really affecting us. Now, you could make the argument that it doesn't matter for television for the most part, because people don't make them more than a million dollars. Um, and so people are working and people are spending money here. It's just not on the kind of projects that we've had, like the Ironmans or what, what have you. Those projects will not come here. That's just an example of something that happened recently with, that I'm intimately involved with. And no matter how I tried to screw the, uh, to skew the figures, it still came out higher to be here. Mm -hmm. That's disappointing, but it's obviously good for us to, to have record of and to know. I have some good news and a, and a comment. Um, it's Amy Tiemann again. Um, I have a new documentary that just came out that I served as an executive producer. It's A Crime on the Bayou by director Nancy Bierski from Durham, who's full frame 
uh, festival founder and it premiered at Doc NYC. And we've gotten great reviews, including saying it should be shown in every classroom in the country. It's a civil rights story. And so, you know, just a very educational film made by North Carolina folks, um, getting great reviews and didn't qualify for any of the programs that exist right now. But just to know what kind of films those those can be. They can be very, you know, high quality educational cultural films. Um, my thought about the, I, I think there's such an opportunity to think about the overall narrative. And this is where others who are more uh, like that guy and others can really maybe think about this is um, with everything shutting down and reopening. I mean, what there must be an opportunity to catch that wave and become a bigger part of the industry for North Carolina as we reopen, if we make certain choices. And I think there are more dramatic ways to present the numbers that we should really think about that when we write the report. Um, just doing some quick math, it looked like the difference between the low and the high, you could either say it is a third of a billion dollars or it was a difference of 780% in both dollars and in job opportunities. So um, if I were in the state legislature, I would sure wanna be part of the group that brought a third of a billion dollars and 780% of increase back to the state. So I really think we should, I mean, I think the report is, is, do, is on a great track, um, but to really, you know, there's opportunities to say yes to things that will be very good for the economic development of the state at a time when we desperately, desperately need it. And in terms of the big picture of the industry, I mean, Tim's story was very compelling. I mean, we wanna be part of the big film industry. I feel like right now we're making the best of what we have and we deserve a lot of credit for that. So I don't mean to negate any of the successes we've had with doing what we have with the current program, but you know, I'm a former scientist. And when you look at that data, it speaks really loudly, but I think we can increase, you know, the way we speak about it in the report to make it more attractive to our state's leaders to say like, you know, especially people who maybe didn't really weren't here in 2014, didn't, don't have that history, don't have an attachment to certain outcomes is like, just look at the data. Okay. We did it this way. We tried it this way. Let's bring this money back to the state. That's a good point, Amy. I think um, we need to present those numbers. I mean, you know, that's a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, I get the press releases from the governor about, you know, X, Y, or Z company came and brought 200 jobs and he's sending out a press release to the whole state about that. And that's fantastic. But we're talking the difference between what was it like 4,000 and 30,000 jobs. Yes. And that's, a, that's huge. That's an entire industry, and especially one that is environmentally safe and has a chance for workforce development. I mean, it has so many other benefits and um, I want more of that for our state. Yes. You know, that's a, um, if you look at Guy's charts, it's just, there's the story. It's like, here's exactly where the program was disbanded. And here is the result of that. Here is where the program was reinstated. And here's the result of that. I mean, no one can argue with that. I think we're a little insiders where we think the data speaks for itself, but it really, in the report, we need we need to speak for the data and not just assume that others are gonna interpret it that way. Thank also, you. as a companion to the report, you know, we've talked about through this whole year that we've been together, telling our story in a compelling way. So as a companion, there's a, a group of us that have been working on and thankfully making progress on uh, a video series documenting uh, these stories, you know, real life stories, and some of the other team can speak to what we need. But um, that one of the biggest needs is capturing, uh, you know, these stories in a very genuine, uh, genuine way, and a diversity of stories throughout the state. So, um, you know, again, one of the team members can share how uh, to get in touch with us to let us know who might be able to be interviewed. Um, because again, this isn't an infomercial or a commercial even, it's a real story of here's the benefit I've seen uh, in the industry, either here or elsewhere. Um, and we're hoping to be able to get at least an initial piece together within the next month or so. So uh, maybe Lauren, Tim, Robert, somebody can uh, pitch in. 
May I suggest that Lauren kind of bring the group up to up to speed as to what we've been doing. Um, and hopefully we're, I think we targeted for the next meeting to have something done and ready to present to you guys. Is that right, Lauren? That's right. I mean, it, right now we're collecting uh, uh, submissions, people recording themselves, trying to put a face to the data and explain through their stories that we have a robust community with, that this impacts. So we're in the gathering phase right now and putting, stringing this, the footage together to see what we have. And we'll continue to do that through uh, December and into January and then start to narrow it down. I think we're, we're looking at a sort of three minute piece to really be able to say, this data that you're looking at affects this large group of cast, crew, vendors, and opportunities for real people in communities across the state. So we'll, we'll follow up with more emails to this group and others to continue to collect this footage. And hopefully that you'll reach out to your networks and have them submit uh, to a Dropbox so that we can start gathering more footage. Thank you, Lauren. That's gonna be a Thank nice you. companion piece. Excuse, I'm sorry, Catherine, to interrupt. Um, well, why don't we have a separate phone call with that, just that subgroup um, and uh, and talk a little bit about it? I know you don't have anything ready to, to show, but we're really excited about this. I think this could be um, a nice product um, that we could use in a variety of ways. That's so um, if, if um, Jennifer, maybe will help us set that up in the next few weeks. I mean, you know. Before the January 12th meeting, if nothing else. Actually, actually if it's okay, the sooner the better, because we have some, oh, okay. specific, some specific questions for you, Secretary, okay. um, that, we, that would help us move forward. And another interesting thing is that we've had difficulties getting, um, I wouldn't say difficulties, but we haven't had the sort of influx of information or, or, or um stories that have come through our Dropbox account. So if you can get that word out locally to any and all of your, not just your vendors, but um, also to crew members themselves. Yeah, we will definitely follow up this meeting with that email. So uh, look out for that email so that you can forward it and facilitate the ease of, of submission to the Dropbox. I think Sorry, um, just just to sort of uh, put a bullet point on that, the I think headlining uh, one of you guys put it very very well is making sure that the data cannot be misinterpreted and that those differentials in numbers that's those numbers stay in state and they positively affect vendors, local crew, um, really headlining every place we can that that's not those aren't numbers that are going back out of state to the, the $4 million to the actor, for example, or to directors or to studios. That is actually income and numbers that are generated in state and staying in state and taking every opportunity. I think that's our best bet for getting a positive legislative response. It's just, you know, we, we don't have to go into the, the details of, um, the working man versus the elite, but that is making sure that that cannot be misconstrued in any way, shape, or form. I think is absolutely vital since so much of this is going to depend on legislative action. Also, I think having seen some of this video that Tim and Lauren and Eric were talking about, um, and having seen the Louisiana promotional film, anytime we can indicate to legislatures that um, there are jobs outside of what they traditionally think of, crew jobs, uh, lumber yards, <laughs> um, caterers, um, policemen. That Tim shot a great interview with uh, Lieutenant at the uh, Wilmington Police Department uh, who, who just talked about what a great financial opportunity this was for local policemen. Um, I think when we're looking to add to this video, we look for people in jobs that were affected by films, television shows, 
who you didn't necessarily think of. We have a car painter out of Reedsville who gives a great interview. Um, and I think that would help to get out of the traditionally thought of roles and just crew. So that's it. I think that's a good idea, Robert. I like it. This is some great feedback, y'all. Truly, yes. we appreciate it. No, it's really good. We have. We have a list for the show we're doing down in Charleston of all the businesses that we've hired outside of our crew. And it's something like 80 businesses. Wow. Yeah, so it has exactly a much that. broader impact than just the crew. Some of their stories could be helpful. I mean, the stories can come from elsewhere because it further documents, you know, what's happening. So um, Jonas, maybe you can share some some of those shops or whatever with us that we, or if you're down there, capture, you know, capture some conversations with them. Yeah, I can get that list because it'll give us, I mean, these are all South Carolina businesses, but I can get that list and it'll give us ideas of people to reach out to um, because it's pretty broad ranging. I end up employing a lot of people. You know, not to get into the creative, but um, we probably, we being uh, the Wilmington region, probably has a similar list. Um, they could tell a story that would be uh, what it what it was and then what it became and what we hope that it will be again. If anybody out there has any like contacts with uh, what one could, would consider, um, you know, uh, sort of more municipal or, or uh, conservatively based uh, ideologies um, so like the the uh, corporal that I interviewed or people that are in sort of the world that these folks in the legislature might be able to uh, relate to uh, better and, and get us away from the, um, you know, the stigma of elite intellectuals are the only ones that really care about this. And I don't mean that derogatorily towards those other jobs. I, I'm just saying that that people in in areas that that they can relate to um that they don't have a preconceived notion of, of like we're just a bunch of film people looking for a handout um, which yeah. is really common and that's one of the biggest things i mean rebecca you're shaking your head we've heard this over and over again for years that is our biggest battle you're on mute susie Yeah, because I was talking to my husband. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. he started putting the dishes away. Bless his heart. And he got yelled at. <laughs> don't don't stop him doing that. Yeah, what am I thinking? <laughs> yeah. My apologies. I was listening. Um, I think that um, these are all great ideas and um, we need to to capture them and and roll with it um, and get this, this, get it in the can, so to speak. So, all right. Well, we will set that meeting up then um, sooner rather than later. Um, and um, anything else for the good of the cause? Um, I'd like to say something. Um, first of all, I agree with uh, Tim. There are a lot of, in uh, the Piedmont Triad region, there are a lot of rural counties who before 2015 benefited tremendously uh, from the film industry and um, lots of little mom and pop shops, florists, dry cleaners, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, and so I think it would be, yeah, I think it would be great to speak to them. But I also think that the legislators, if we can try to spread the business out throughout the state, they're going to respond to that too favorably. If we can have either some kind of tiered incentive or some kind of incentive to film outside of the main places. But I know if we brought back the film incentive as it was, there was so much production in North Carolina, it eventually spread out throughout the rest of the state. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, anyway, to, if, if, if our legislature can see it's benefiting all of North Carolina, I think, you know, I think they might be more on board. Well, to speak to that, Rebecca, we, we've sold a, we got, I got a little bit of news. We've sold a, a show, another show to Netflix that would shoot in the Western part of the state, hopefully in the 
spring. Um, stick to you now. Fingers crossed, but it's looking good right now. <laughs> That's well, great. Congratulations. Yes. Yay. Yeah, thanks. You know, I think that DNCR has, our department has, at least over the last four years that I'm aware of, has, uh, we have create, uh, created, gathered, I mean, we have so much content. Um, and there's, I mean, I don't know if, if we've, we focused a lot of our first four years on rural development um, and redevelopment because that, you know, speaks to things like historic preservation and, and, and you know, natural resources. We have state parks and most of our state parks are located in, in very rural areas. So um, there's a network there through Hometown Strong and other um, and, and our agency that I think we can also delve into. And, and I think people also need to understand that content is king right now, isn't it? I mean, people are, are we running out of things to watch? I mean, I'm watching Acorn TV, y'all, in Australia. And it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, there's a demand here that is unprecedented, I think, in its, in its, timing, if you will, and in the short amount of time that it happened, um, you know, uh, um, and how quickly things shut down is what I mean. So anyway, that's just, I just something I really like to remind people and put out there because we can package some of this stuff and it becomes a, it, it becomes something we can hand out. It, maybe we've already got something like that, that, that showcases our more rural locations. And then we can point to things like um, Ebbing, I, I'm, I never get the, the title of this, that movie right. It was so good. Um, but the three billboard billboards in Ebbing, Missouri, was it? Yeah, anyway. Um, so we have stories we can already tell. I, I think that's um, something we really need to, to also talk a little further about. Maybe we can um, do something with that on that, that call we're getting ready to set up. What do y'all think? Okay, I see some heads bobbing. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Happy holidays if we don't see you before. And um, thank you again for all y'all did in 2020. I think this has just been a wild ride. I'm glad we were on it together. <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Have Thanks, a great Susan. week. Right. Have a great holiday. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.